shit too, so. <laughs> السلام عليكم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين إن شاء الله I will be moderating this session Our guest speaker today is Brother Jeffrey Lang He's a professor of math at the University of Candace, Kansas he, he has three beautiful daughters and he, he wanted me to say that he misses them and his wife very very much so, inshallah, that message will get to them. <laughs> the tape will reach them. Okay. Um, this topic for tonight is Pillars of Islam, the Spiritual Dimension. So, Brother Jeffrey, go ahead. They're low. <laughs> oh, good. See, my head is about up here. Good. Yeah, I think. That, can you hear me? Should I do the same to this? Uh, okay. <coughs> All right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. Well, they gave me two hours. <laughs> the program is supposed to last till nine. I don't think it will. What I have to say is brief. It shouldn't take me more than 30, 35 minutes. And then there will be some question and answers. And hopefully you'll all get out of here at least by eight o'clock. Um, When Brother Hamid, Hamid Hazali, Vice President of ISNA, invited me to this conference, I told him I have run out of things to talk about. So he asked me, uh, what are you writing about lately? I told him I'm writing a book called Even the Angels Asked. I'm coming up towards the end of it. And right now I'm writing about the pillars of Islam. And he said, well, then talk about that. And I said, Hamid, the audience has heard this subject time and time again, and I have nothing new to say. And they know as much about this subject as I do. So he said, well, come anyway, we need a speaker. <laughs> 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 and uh, just make it brief. So here I am. Um, in the book, I'm trying to take a new angle or at least what I perceive to be a new angle in discussing the five pillars of Islam. When I was studying Islam as a non-Muslim, and I came across books that dealt with this subject, I inevitably found that it was covered in a very dry and sort of mechanical fashion. The pillars were described in detail as far as how to perform them. Uh, several hadith about their merits were quoted, and that was the extent of it. And as a non-Muslim, as an atheist, as a matter of fact, considering this religion, out of curiosity mostly, I found that this subject was perhaps one of the least inspiring, as it's often covered in texts on Islam. It was inevitably the least inspiring chapter. The reason being because, as an American, when I think thought of faith back in those days, I thought of the spiritual side of faith. To me, as an American, faith meant something spiritual. So when I came upon the Islamic rituals, I, expe I expected to find something deeply spiritual and profound. And I inevitably, I found it to be very dry and matter-of-fact. And I was greatly disappointed. So today, I would like you to sit there for a while and think about how you would take a fellow like me back in those days and how you would explain to him your experience of the pillars of Islam. What do they mean to you? What do they do for you? 
What do you get out of them? What do you accomplish by doing them? And remember that you're talking to somebody that didn't grow up in your tradition. So even though I know this subject that I'm about to discuss is well known to all of you, I want this to be an exercise for all of us. An exercise in trying to communicate one of the most important elements of our religion to those who are not of our religion. This is my own, my own attempt, and I hope you will formulate your own, because when you do communicate your belief, your faith, experience to non-Muslims, you do have to do it, I believe, in a way that's personal, so that they, that is what will move them. That will, let, will be what will make them appreciate your faith experience. So I, in other words, I don't want you to mimic what I'm saying here today. I want you to internalize these questions yourself, and hopefully, and to communicate that personal experience of faith to others. It's important to remember that when, when I'm about to give this lecture, that I was an atheist for many, many years. From the time I was about 16 to the time I was 28. Because that will help you to understand the first story I'm going to begin with, this lecture with. Because when you're an atheist, you reject God outright. And when you do such a thing, you're committing a grave and dangerous wrong. Grave and dangerous because you are harming yourself, your soul, your person, in very profound ways. And when you convert to Islam, there's a lot of repair work to do. Because you've done such damage to yourself, you've built up so much pride, so much vanity, so many harmful qualities, that it's going to take some time to break them down and to build all over again and to construct your character. The account I'm about to begin this story with is not flattering to me. It's actually very embarrassing. And I have a difficult time sharing it with you because it doesn't put me in a very good light. But I do think it says something about the mercy and the glory and the grandeur of God, of Allah, the Almighty and the Merciful. And for that reason, I share it with you. Before I begin it, I would, that story, I would just like to tell you something, a quote that an imam of a masjid in San Francisco once said to me when I asked him about his experience of prayer. He said, and when we pray and put our nose to the ground, we feel a joy, a rest, a strength that is outside this world, and no words could ever truly describe. You just have to experience it to know. Of all the words I ever heard in my life, those words were the words that unlocked the key in my soul that got me to the stage where I was ready to become a Muslim. <clears throat> On the day I converted to Islam, the Imam of the student masjid gave me a manual on how to perform Salat, the Islamic prayer rituals. Take it easy, the Muslim students told me. Don't push yourself too hard. It's better to take your time, you know, slowly, slowly. First time I heard that expression, slowly, slowly. Slowly, slowly. <laughs> I'd hear it a lot after that. I was dumbfounded. I was surprised by their concern. How hard could it be to pray, I wonder. When I was uh, back in my childhood, I prayed all the time. It didn't seem pretty effortless. effortless. In any case, that same night, I decided to ignore their advice, which I typically do. And I decided to start performing the five prayers at their appointed scheduled times. So I sat for a long time on my couch in the small, dimly lit living room of my Diamond Heights apartment in San Francisco, studying and rehearsing the prayer postures. I also studied and rehearsed the verses of the Quran that I needed to recite and the supplications that I would have to make. Now, much of what I had to say would be in Arabic. So I had not only to memorize the meaning, but I had to memorize the Arabic transliterations and their interpretations that the manual provided. 
So I poured over this manual for a couple of hours at least, maybe three and even four, before I felt confident enough to attempt my first Islamic prayer. And it was close to midnight, so I decided to perform the Asha prayer. Well, I walked into the bathroom where the vanity is, uh, placed the manual on the sink counter, and with it open to the section that described how to perform uh, the washing for the prayer, I opened it up and I started to follow the instructions very meticulously. I was like a cook trying a recipe for the first time. I was sort of following the instructions and looking over here and doing this, and they gave pictures. When I was done, I shut off the faucet and returned to my living room. And with water still dripping from various parts of my body, for the instructions stated that it's preferable not to dry oneself with a towel after a wash for the prayer, I stood there dripping and trying to find, the, approximate the right direction. So I stood in the center of the room, aimed myself in the direction of what I hoped was Mecca, although I'd never been there before. I glanced back over my shoulder then to make sure that the apartment door was secured and locked. As frankly, I was a little bit embarrassed and nervous. I didn't want any neighbors passing by or knocking on the door, pushing it open and saying, what's Jeff doing now? <laughs> Turned around, looked at the door, it was locked, it was bolted, checked again, just the second time, making sure again, definitely it was locked and bolted. And then I looked straight ahead, straightened my stance, took a very deep breath, raised my hands to the side of my face with my palms open and my thumbs touching my earlobes, and then in a very hushed voice, I pronounced, Allahu Akbar. And I hoped no one heard me. I felt a little bit anxious, a little bit embarrassed, even a little bit humiliated. I couldn't re rid myself of the feeling that someone was out there somewhere spying on me. Then I suddenly realized, and I was seized with panic, that I had left the curtains to my living room open. <laughs> what if a neighbor should look in and see me, I thought. I stopped what I was doing, went to the window, flashed the light outside, looked around the backyard. Thank God it was empty. Okay, so I drew the curtains carefully to a close, made sure that they overlapped so nobody could peek through any crack, turned to my position in the middle of the room. Once again, approximated the direction of Mecca, stood straight, raised my hands to where my thumbs were touching my earlobes, and whispered, this time even more quiet than I did the first time, Allahu Akbar. In a barely audible tone, I slowly and clumsily recited the first surah of the Quran, and then another short surah after that, in Arabic. Although I'm sure that any Arabs, if they had heard me that night, wouldn't have understood a word I said. <laughs> I then quietly said another Allahu Akbar, and bowed with my back perpendicular to my legs and with my hands grasping my knees. I had never bowed to anyone or anything before, and I felt embarrassed. I was glad that I was alone, and while still in bowing pro position, I repeated several times the phrase, Subhanahu Rabbi al Glory be to my Lord the Great. I then stood up and recited as best I could, Sami Allahu liman hamida, God hears those who praise him, and then, Rabbana wa lak al hamd, our Lord, and to you belongs all praise. And at that moment, I felt my pulse racing, and my heart pounding, and my anxiety mount, mounting, as I meekly called out another, Allahu Akbar. I had arrived at the moment when I had to perform a sajda, a prostration, and I stood there frozen. I was petrified. I stared at the area in front of me on the carpet where I was supposed to be down on all fours and with my face to the ground, and I couldn't do it. I just could not do it. I must have stood there 30 seconds. 
I could not get myself to lower myself to the floor, to humble myself with my nose to the ground, like a slave groveling before his master. It was as if my legs and back had braces on them that would not let me bend. I felt too ashamed and humiliated. I could imagine the snickers and cackles of friends and acquaintances watching me make a fool of myself. I envisioned how ridiculous and pitiable I would look to them. Poor Jeff, I could hear them all saying. He really went Arab crazy in San Francisco, didn't he? <laughs> please, please, please help me do this, I pray. I took a deep breath. And then I forced myself to that floor. Now on my hands and knees, I hesitated for a brief moment. My neck was stiff. I couldn't put it down. I then pushed my face to that carpet. Ridding my mind of all other thoughts, I mechanically pronounced three times. I didn't think about what I was saying. I just didn't allow even a whisper to enter my mind. Subhana Rabbi Alala, Subhana Rabbi Alala, Subhana Rabbi Alala. Robotically, I said it three times. Glory be to my Lord in the highest. Allahu Akbar, I called out and sat back on my heels. I had memorized this part. I knew what to say, and I wasn't going to do anything else but just get through it. I kept my mind blank refusing to allow any distractions to enter it. Allah Akbar, I pronounced again, and stuck my face once again onto that carpet. With my nose touching the ground, I called out mechanically, Subhana Rabbi Alala, Subhana Rabbi Alala, Subhana Rabbi Alala, glory be to my Lord in the highest. I just wasn't going to stop myself. I was going to get through this even if it killed me. Allah Akbar, I called, and lifted myself from the floor, and stood up straight. Three cycles I go, to go, I told myself, reassuring myself, as if I was swallowing some bitter and difficult medicine. I had to wrestle with my emotions and pride the entire rest of the prayer. But it did get a little easier with each cycle. I was even almost calm during the last prostration. While in the final sitting posture, I recited the Tashahud and then entered, ended the prayer by saying, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, calling it over my right shoulder. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, peace be upon you and the mercy of God, calling it over my left. And I sat there, spent, completely exhausted. And I remained there on the floor, reviewing the battle I had just been through. I was extremely embarrassed that I had to struggle so hard to get through but a single prayer. With my head lowered in shame, very much in shame, I prayed, please forgive me for my arrogance, for my vanity, for my stupidity. I have come from very, very far, and I still have very far to go. At that moment, I experienced something which I had never felt before, and which is therefore very difficult for me to put into words. A wave of what I could only describe as coldness swept through me, which seemed to radiate from some point within my chest. It was rather intense, and I was initially startled, and I remember shuddering. However, it was much more than a physical sensation. It affected my emotions as well in a strange way. It was as if mercy had taken on some kind of objective form and it's now penetrating and enveloping me and flowing through me. I cannot say exactly why, but I began to cry. Tears began to run down my face, and I found, found myself weeping uncontrollably. And the harder I cried, the more I felt the embrace of the most powerful kindness and compassion. I was not crying out of guilt, although I probably should have, nor was I crying out of shame or joy. It was as if this huge dam of pain, this huge dam of anger had been unblocked and all that pain and anger and suffering was pouring out of me and being released. As I say these words to you, I cannot help but wonder if God's forgiveness is more than his mere absolution of our sins, if his forgiveness is not also soothing and repairing, curative and assuaging as well. 
I remained on my knees, crouched to the floor with my head in my hands, sobbing for some time. When I finally stopped crying, I was completely exhausted. The experience I just had was for me too unfamiliar and overwhelming to try to rationalize at that moment. And I also thought it was too, definitely too strange to tell anyone about right away. Although in the months and years to come, I had other intense spiritual experiences during prayers, and I'm sure you all have as well. And with conversations with Muslims, I came to realize that there was nothing unusual or bizarre about that prayer experience. <laughs> However, at that moment, I did realize this much, that I needed Allah, that I needed God, and I needed prayer for the rest of my life desperately. Before getting up from my knees, I made one last supplication. Oh God, if I ever gravitate towards disbelief again, please, please kill me first. Take this life from me. It's hard enough to live with my imperfections and weaknesses, but I cannot live another day denying you. Hasten to Salah. Hasten to prayer, hasten to falah, hasten to success, our Adhan urges us. If our main purpose in life is to grow ever nearer to Allah, to God, then towards this end, prayer has to be essential. For Muslims, salat is one of the most important ways to pursue and experience this goal of growing ever nearer to Allah, to God Almighty. Salat is a Muslim spiritual compass by which he or she repeatedly checks his or her progress and direction in life. And it is his or her lifeline to paradise in the hereafter because through that experience they could almost feel God's mercy in an intimate and powerful way, in a way that no other thing on earth could provide. Through the experience of Salat, a Muslim tries to stay alert to the fluctuations of his faith. A Muslim will ask himself or herself, am I becoming lazy about my prayers lately? Am I rushing through them without feeling any benefit? Are my experiences of prayer weaker or stronger than they used to be? Do I feel closer or farther from God in my prayers these days? Although each of the five pillars helps a Muslim gauge his growth in faith, the Salat is the principal day-to-day -day measure of a believer's submission to Allah Almighty. To perform the Islamic ritual prayer five times every day, day in, day out, at the appointed times, requires considerable commitment to Islam. A single salat ritual prayer is not very taxing. It takes but just a few minutes. But to rise out of bed before dawn, Every day of the year, weekday or weekend, workday or holiday, no matter what kind of day it is, every day of the year, day in, day out, for the rest of one's life, to make the Fajr prayer on time, before the crack of dawn, already demands considerable commitment to Islam and considerable determination. All of Islam's rituals test and challenge and help to build a Muslim's willpower and self-control in various ways. And in so doing, these rituals help to build those qualities in us. Determination, self-control, stick-to-itiveness, persistence, willpower, strength. The Shahada tests a person's allegiances. Are you a, is your main allegiance to Allah, or is it to something else? Is your main allegiance to this community, or is it to some other community? Is your allegiance to the Muslims or to another nation? Is your allegiance to God or is your allegiance to your boss at work? Which comes first? The Shahada is a continuous and persistent test of that allegiance. The fast of Ramadan tests the control, our control over our physical needs. The zakat tests our ability to discipline our material desires and to extend the bounty that God has given us and to share it with our fellow man. The pilgrimage to Mecca, in some ways, tests all of the three things I just mentioned. But the Salat may not be as emotionally demanding as a convert's first shahada. 
and it might not be as physically and material demanding as the other three pillars of Islam. But the ritual prayer, more than any other ritual in Islam, tests constancy and perseverance, tests our ability to stick to it. I have known many Muslims who fast every Ramadan and don't miss a day and do it right. I have known many Muslims who not only do that, but pay zakat every year and pay what they owe and even more. I have known Muslims who do not only those two, but who have made the Hajj and have followed the Sunnah and followed it to the T when it comes to making the Hajj. And I've known those same Muslims and among them, I've known a considerable number of them who can't make the five prayers every day, day in and day out. Most of us, most of us are capable of great moments of virtue or religiosity on occasion. We could rise to the occasion on rare occasions. Almost all of, it ha all of us have it within us. But very few of us, only a minority of mankind could be consistently religious, could be consistently virtuous. In terms of our moral and spiritual growth, we are too often like persons who decide that they're going to go and get physically fit by going out and run a 20-kilometer marathon. We say, oh my goodness, I'm getting out of shape. The stomach. Or as the Arabs say, the kirsh. Is it kirsh? <laughs> Getting a little flabby. I gotta get in shape. So the guy goes and puts on his jogging suit, sweatshirt, jeans, goes out and buys new sneakers, new socks, sunglasses, headband, gets all ready, watch, glass of water, goes out and tries to run 20 kilometers, comes back exhausted, dead, falls into bed, blisters all over his feet, can't get up the next day, lies in bed and for 10 more days, puts on 16 pounds because he hasn't moved. <laughs> it does sound ridiculous, but many of us approach faith in the same way. Everyone knows that in order to get physically fit, you have to find a, follow a regular and steady program of exercise. But somehow we feel that to become religious, we're just going to get out the beads, and we're going to recite Quran all day, and we're going to make supplications and do extra prayers, and fast all day, and we get really religious for two or three days, and then we get so burnt out that we just give it up and take it easy for a while and think, well, I'll get religious later. That type of attitude, whether in the physical sphere or the spiritual sphere, is damaging because it teaches us failure. It teaches us that we can't. It helps to encourage us to be lazy. Failure, continual failure, produces a failure. Continued success produces a success. So in the physical sphere, we understand that we need a regular program to follow. When you go to your high school football coach, I played high school football. No pain, no gain, boys. Get out there every day got to run this, you got to do these exercises every day. No pain, no gain. Got to stick to this program. Don't stick to this program. You're not going to make it. And we understand him. It's as plain as rain. We know he's right. We walk into the classroom, our teachers, got to do your homework every day. Got to work hard every day. Brain will atrophy. Work hard. Keep studying. You're going to be a failure. You want to be a success. Got to work hard. We know he's right. But somehow we think that there's a whole different law that comes with our spiritual development. We think it's like magic. But Islam teaches us that we have to find a regular, follow this regular program, which begins with the five pillars of Islam. And we can't forget that most important pillar, the Islamic prayer. <clears throat> the Quran repeatedly, repeatedly exhorts the believer to develop Suffer. The Arabic word that con connotes patience, perseverance, fortitude, stick to itiveness, a quality that is essential to spiritual development. It's, not, it's essential to any kind of development. 
Very often these exhortations that talk about suburb occur with exhortations to do what? Establish the regular prayer. Those are the believers who establish prayer and are patient in adversity. How many times do we see those, that connection made throughout the Quran? Because the two obviously complement each other. Yet the rewards of Salat far outweigh the demands. Just want to check if I'm running over time. No. <laughs> Yet the rewards of Salat far outweigh the demands. A Muslim student once informed me, as I mentioned in the beginning of this lecture, that the power of Salat is indescribable. If you'll let me quote him again, he said that when we pray and put our nose to the ground, we feel a joy, a rest, a strength that is outside these, this world and no words could ever describe. You have to experience it to know. But you, my brothers and sisters, are not ignorant of that experience, or at least you sh shouldn't be. You should know. The day he told me this was the day I became a Muslim. It was not long before I began to understand, begin to understand what he meant. For there are moments during Salat, moments of truth, of true honesty, sincerity, and humility. When a Muslim perceives the infinite presence of God's most merciful and compassionate light. These are not moments that can be anticipated. For you, as you all know, they almost always come unexpectedly. But when those moments come, and they do, a Muslim feels the caress of the most tender and most overpowering kindness. This is an utterly humbling experience because a Muslim knows that it's too infinitely beautiful to be deserved. It is a tremendously intoxicating experience because with your hands, feet, and face firmly to the ground, you feel like you're suddenly lifted into heaven, into paradise, and you could breathe its air and smell its fragrances and soil and feel its gentle breezes. It feels as if, as if you're about to be raised off the ground and to be placed in the arms of the most benevolent, benevolent and affectionate love. These moments of divine intimacy create in the worshiper an overpowering longing to be near to God. And the hereafter and growing nearer and nearer to God becomes the focus of that person's living and striving and dying. This helps us understand why devout Muslims are so zealous about their prayers, why they're so strict about them, why they could seemingly prefer death to missing but a single ritual prayer. So you can, and that is why you, they, these Muslims, these pious Muslims, who know the power and the beauty of prayer, you could see them. You could see them at airports, and you could see them on city sidewalks, and in city parks, in public buildings, alone or in congregation, standing, bowing, sitting, and prostrating, paying no attention to the hustle and bustle around them as if they were in a world all their own. This is because they have come to need the Salat so desperately. It has become their main source of spiritual sustenance and their most personal and powerful means of relating to Allah, the God Almighty. A devout Muslim cannot risk missing a single Salat, for he knows that his spiritual center what people refer to symbolically, symbolically as one's heart. He knows that that is real and that it grows in its ability to receive and experience the, the divine with the continual and steadfast performance of the ritual prayer. This is a conviction born of study, as he finds in the Quran, statements in the Quran, and also statements in the Sunnah to that effect. But more than that is a conviction that is also born of experience. A Muslim comes to know firsthand that his spirituality and spiritual re receptivity, 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 <laughs> increases with and depends on the persistent exercise of prayer. But as I have stated on many occasions, and the Quran makes perfectly clear, and so does the Prophet's teachings, 
peace be upon him. A Muslim growth is also tied to his deeds and his relationship with others. Perform prayer and do righteous deeds. A fact that is also reinforced by the form of the congregational prayer. Because even in the congregational prayer, our dependence, not only on Allah, but our commitment to our fellow man is emphasized by the very form in which we pray. As you all know, we stand shoulder to shoulder, foot to foot, in tight formation, leaving no gaps in between us. The visual beauty and gracefulness of our ritual prayer depends on our obeying the instructions of the Imam in unison and moving as one. Have you ever seen the pilgrims pray in Mecca during Hajj? They're all bowing and coming up at one time, that beautiful sea of white where all the pilgrims bow and come up and prostrate as one. It's a beautiful confluence you see before you, especially if you see it from up high, as if you travel to the Middle East and seen the cameras come down on that beautiful sight. All of that depends on the believers living and acting in that moment as one and following each other's anticipating each other's movement and following the instructions of the Imam. A Muslim student once informed me that he could not understand why the Prophet ordered his companions, peace be upon uh, Prophet Muhammad, to pray in such close contact with each other when they're trying to devote all their attention to Allah. He said to me, how can I concentrate on Allah when I have this person rubbing against me on my right and rubbing against me on my left, and kneeling, sitting against me on my right and left, squeezed in there like sardines. And then he said, please don't say this to any of the other brothers. <laughs> you know, you're a convert, I can talk about these. <laughs> I told him that perhaps he had confirmed with his question an important Islamic theme, that even in our most intense worship, we should not forget that our relationship to Allah Almighty is tied to our relationship with our fellow human beings. That we should never forget our brother on our right and our brother on our left, nor our sister on our right or left as well. That our future and the hereafter depends on our relationship to them. There's a well-known saying of the Prophet, peace be upon him, where he insists that a Muslim should not leave a gap between him, herself, and his, her neighbor during the prayer. Otherwise, they will leave an opening for, as you all know, shaitan, for Satan. Another Muslim student also had the courage to come up to me, and I don't blame him. I wish more would do this. We learn by it. Come up to me and he said that, uh, that sounded so silly to him. He said, how could Satan come up? <laughs> you know, you leave a door by leaving a little space. What does he do, creep in there and reach over? And, you know? <laughs> And he got very animated about it. He said, well, that always sounded very ridiculous to him. So I asked him, I said, when you were performing a congregational prayer, did it so happen that the person you were praying with ever intentionally, or at least you thought intentionally, left a space between you and him? And he thought about it for a minute. He said, yes, that's happened to me several times. And I said, how did you feel? He said, very angry. What, did he think he was too good for me? could not pray beside me? He thought he'd come from some great family or something? He was somehow a superior believer to me? Believe me, I've seen him walking around campus. He looks at all the ladies. I've seen him. I come from a big family. He comes from a small family. My ancestors are so great. His are nothing. I come from this country. I looked at him and I said, see? <laughs> a door to Satan was open. A door to temptation was left open. As time passed, I grew more and more to appreciate the student imam statement that the beauty of Salat cannot be truly described. Its beauty seems to have no upper bounds, and it increases over time with the consistent performance of the five daily prayers. And as it does, the believer comes to see with ever greater clarity just how much is at stake in this life. How much there is to gain, because he gets a hint of it through the beauty of that prayer, and how much there is to lose. 
A pious Muslim parent can certainly understand the urgency behind Prophet Abraham's prayer, peace be upon him, as described in the Quran, when he said, O oh my Lord, make me one who establishes regular salat, and of my descendants, our Lord, my Lord, was a desperate plea and prayer. I came to appreciate that in a very real way one day when I was praying the noon prayer with my daughter, my oldest daughter, Jamila. We had just finished the noon prayer, and then she said something that just sort of, I wasn't anticipating. She said, the kids ask the simplest questions, and yet they're the most poignant sometimes. She said, Daddy, why do we pray? And her question caught me off guard. I didn't expect it from an eight-year-old, although I know she's quite clever. I knew, of course, the most obvious answer, that as Muslims we're obligated to. But I, did, I didn't want to waste the opportunity to share with her the beauty and the power of the experience of prayer. Because if you miss those type of opportunities with your children and you just give them a dry answer that doesn't really come to the depth of that question they ask, we as parents are blowing an opportunity. We have an experience of prayer. But just to give them just a curt response, well, we have to, <laughs> means that we're not willing to take the effort to can really deeply consider that questions, those questions they ask, and share with them the experience we've gained of practicing this faith over time. Nevertheless, before answering her, I tried to buy a little time by giving the usual response. Well, hon, we pray because God wants us to. But I knew that wouldn't do. I still say that Jamila's going to become a lawyer someday. She never lets a question remain half answered. But why, Daddy? What does praying do for us? She asked. I told her it's hard to explain to a young person. I told her that someday, she performs five prayers every day. I'm sure she'll begin to understand. But I told her nonetheless that I'll try to do the best I can to describe to her, to answer her question from a personal point of view. I told her, you see, Jamila, God is the source of all the love, mercy, kindness, wisdom, of all the beauty that we experience and feel in this life. You know how the sun is the source of the light we see in the daytime, I told her? God is the source of all these beautiful things I just described and so much more. So that the love I feel for you and your sisters and your mommy is given to me by God to feel. The mercy that I feel in my heart towards you and towards others is a tiny fraction tiniest fraction of the mercy that God has imparted on this world, which represents only a tiniest fraction of his great mercy, for he is the source of all the mercy that exists everywhere. And in his kindness, and in his generosity, he allows that mercy to flourish inside of us, to grow inside of us, to fill our hearts, so that we could know his mercy approximately but so beautifully, because in his kindness, he shares that with us. I said, for example, I told him that, I told her this, when we pray, we could feel God's love and kindness and mercy in a very special way, in the most powerful way. I told her, think about this example. You know that mommy and I love you, I told her. By the way we care for you, but, but, and the things we give you, but when we hug and kiss you, when we embrace you, you could feel that love, that mercy, that feeling we have for you flow through us to you. I told her, it's not something you can measure. It's not something you could calculate. It's not something you could even describe to your friend. But when you feel it, you know. 
I said, when you feel it, it is more real to you than the ground you walk on. And you could identify it. And you respond by telling us, Mommy, Daddy, I love you. Because you've just received ours. I said, in a similar way, we know that God loves us by all that he has given to us and all the beautiful things that we have and that he bestows upon us and he protects us. But when we pray, we can feel his love, his mercy, his kindness in a unique and very special way. Does praying make you a better daddy? She asked. I said, I hope so. And I told her I would like to think so. Because once you are touched by God's love and kindness in the prayer, it is so beautiful and so powerful that you cannot but want to share it with others. When you experience something that's so beautiful, that's so powerful, that fills you to such an extent, you have this, we in humans have this natural desire to communicate that to others. On the simplest level, think about it when you're walking around in life and you look up walking around, you're walking down the street, and suddenly you look up and you see this beautiful cloud formation or a beautiful sunset, and it strikes you as so beautiful, and you sit there looking at it. What's the natural thing you do? You look to your right and left to see if anyone else is enjoying it. Maybe you'll even say to another person standing there, gazing at the same same scene you are, isn't that beautiful? because you want to share that with others. When God touches us with his love and mercy and salah, in a way that is the prophet used to always say, peace be upon him, that is more beautiful and greater than this world and all it contains, you naturally want to share that with others. And those, especially those most closest to you, which mean your family and your loved ones and your children. And so that is what I told you. I said, you know, when I come home from work, I said a lot of times I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I put up with that department head all day and those goofy colleagues, and I come home and I am frustrated and I'm angry and I'm tired, and I just want to come in this house and I don't want to hear a sound, and I just want to go to my room and be left alone and to just be quiet for a half hour. But I told her, when I make that salad, then I suddenly look around, and because of the beauty that God allows us to feel, I look around and I see the gifts that he has given me, and you, Jamila, and your sisters, and your mommy. And it just makes me feel how much he has given to me, and how much I owe him, and you, as my daughter, and your mom, as my, as my wife. I asked her, am I making any sense to you at all? Because I got sort of into it. <laughs> and she looked at me, and I don't know if she got 100% of what I said, but she did say this. She said, and Lumia is very honest, and she said, I kind of understand what you mean. And then she hugged me and said, and I love you, Daddy. And I told her, I love you too, sweetie pie. <laughs> And I love you too. And may the peace and mercy of Allah be upon you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Sent it by a sister who's nine years old. It says, What did you tell people when you became Muslim and how did they act? I told them I became a Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, when I became a Muslim, I hardly had to tell anybody. Uh, strange thing happened. I was working at a Catholic university, Christian university, run by the Society of Jesus. And uh, I was an atheist at the time, but I didn't tell them. Just wanted the job. 
<laughs> well, and I have a Catholic name and Catholic background, so, <laughs> you know, let them assume what they will. I got the job. Well, I was not on the job but three months at the University of San Francisco, and I became a Muslim. And there were only two or three people in the mosque that day, well, about four, that day I became a Muslim, a student-run masjid, so I didn't assume that the news would travel very fast or far. Well, the next day I'm walking on campus, and all these Muslim students are coming up to me saying, uh, are you the professor who became a Muslim? <laughs> and I'm looking around and thinking, are they going to kill me or what? <laughs> I looked at them, yes. <laughs> And then a big smile would come on their face, and they'd say, congratulations, congratulations, all day long, congratulations, congratulations, everywhere I'd go, congratulations. Well, some students would walk by me, Middle Eastern-looking students would just walk by me, smile, and say, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> so I started to get nervous. <laughs> and I swear, if I walked into class and a professor said, congratulations, I was going to really get scared. But in any case, it didn't quite work out that way. With all this news among the Muslim community, that very same day, one of the professors on campus found out that I had become a Muslim. And he was another professor. I had, was hired a tenure-track job. He was just hired as a temporary, but he thought if I got fired, he could get my job. <laughs> so he went around the entire campus telling the administration, every professor he saw, every secretary, any person he could run into, that Jeff Lang became a Muslim. <laughs> And no sooner or not, I, uh, within, a, honest, this was in from the beginning of day to the end of day, I had professors walking by me saying, is it true? <laughs> Did you become a Muslim? So my start in Islam was, I didn't have to tell anybody anything. Within a couple of weeks, I was probably the most famous Muslim in San Francisco. <laughs> Believe me, I didn't want to be. I just wanted to just relax somewhere, you know, just be like everybody else. But I was immediately in the spotlight. So I didn't have to tell anybody. I had to sort of defend the decision I made right from the start. But my reasons for becoming a Muslim were essentially this. I was an atheist with very strong objections to the idea of God, very strong rational objections. At least I thought I had. Through the process of reading the Quran, not only did I find a solution to those objections, but I discovered God in the process. And I became a Muslim. So it was easy for me to defend my choice. I told them, I was not, as an atheist for these reasons, I became a Muslim because these were the answers I got from my religion. And they would just stand there and say, not bad. <laughs> Makes sense. If I ever become a religious person someday, I'll think about it. You know, so I had no difficulty defending what I had done. So, right from the moment I became a Muslim, I was put in a position of having to defend myself. The only difficulty I really had was telling my mo mother that I had become a Muslim. Because she was a very devout Christian. And then uh, I became an atheist. That was a big shock in her life. But when I became a Muslim, that was even worse as far as she was concerned. And uh, I had a difficult time telling her. Uh, the couple days after I became a Muslim, I called her on the phone. And she was the first person that I personally notified about what I had done. And uh, it was uh, a very emotionally charged three weeks that, that semester break when I went home and had to defend what I had done to my parents. Because uh, I had to explain Islam to them from A to Z. And uh, we spent, we were up till five in the morning every night, my mother and I, discussing religion for like two weeks straight, exhausting each other. But in the end, she came to have a healthy respect for my religion. At one point she said, I understand why you became a Muslim. A person who thinks the way you do, I wasn't quite sure what that meant, but a person who thinks the way you do, I can understand why that religion would definitely appeal to them. And then she said to me, but I'm sorry son, but I could never become a Muslim. And I told her, I never even suggested the idea. And uh, after that, we agreed to discuss it for a long time, and we did. But finally, she asked me at one stage not to discuss it anymore. And so we just hardly ever discuss it anymore. Unless she brings it up, then I'll discuss it with her. But I'll never bring it up first, because she immediately becomes defensive and has a very difficult time on it. So thank you. Okay, so uh, Michelle, the next question is, uh, 
When people tell you I want to learn about Islam, but because of my studies, or at that moment cannot find time, how should we respond? Is it because of their fear, or, they, or can they truly not find the time? I don't understand. So they say they want to learn about Islam, but they said they don't have the time? They, they say like they have studies, but they, don't have the, they can't find the time to pray. Or, oh. So they want to know what they should do with that. So they want to learn, but they can't find the time. Right. Or oh. it could be they miss their prayers because they have too much to do. Oh. Well, I don't know. If you're talking about a non-Muslim who says he's interested in learning about Islam, but he, this is not a good time for him, uh, you know, I always say to people, well, I mean, you've got, it's your choice. I'm, I'm not going to ram my religion down your throat. And I, and I never will. But, you know, I, I tell them that I think that I'll usually reinforce them. I'll tell them that the search for, one, for truth and the search for a relationship with God is very important. I don't see how it could be more important than anything else in the world. And I usually tell them to start learning about Islam, you don't have to look very far. All you have to do is pick up a uh, pretty good interpretation of the Quran in English and just read a few pages a night. It takes you four or five minutes. I said, it's really no great commitment of time. In no time at all, I told them. By the time you finish even the second surah of the Quran, you'll have a pretty good summary knowledge of Islam. Oh, well, that's sort of how, and the reason why I said that is that's how I sort of started. I had received a copy of the Quran from some friends, and I decided I would just read a few pages a night just to get an idea. And I read the opening surah of the Quran. And when I got done, it dawned on me that I had just read a prayer for guidance. And I felt like I had almost tricked into it. Because I got to the end, and I said, hey, I just read a prayer for guidance. I'm not a Muslim. I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. I just read a prayer for guidance. So you can imagine my reaction when I opened and went on to the next page, which began the second surah of the Quran, entitled The Cow, and it began, Aleph, Lam, Mim, that is the book, or in no doubt, is guidance for those who have fear of taqwa. I was shocked. It was just a voice from heaven was calling down to me. I had no sooner just prayed for guidance, semi-consciously, and now the next surah was answering my prayer. That! They translated it this, but this author happened to translate it as that, and I'm glad he did, because that's the literal inter translation. That! What? That? This? This book? That book! What book? This book? That book is the book, we're in no doubt, is guidance for those who have fear, who have taqwa, religious consciousness. I was stunned. And so as I read through the Quran, I was intrigued immediately. What does it say? <laughs> so I started reading through the Quran. And in the beginning it describes the people will be guided by this revelation. It's as if it was written for a non-believer. I'm only surprised when Muslims think that it's read for believers and you shouldn't share it with non-believers. Its principal audience originally were mostly non-believers. They're the ones that heard it. When I read it, I felt it was definitely read for a non-believer. I'm not saying it is only, it's written for everyone. It's revealed for everyone. But I could feel it talking to me. It begins, it begins by describing its audience. Who will benefit most by this? Who will benefit least by this? Who will be in sort of the middle? Describes the believers and their qualities. Three or four verses talks about the people who have a completely closed mind. They won't even consider this. They won't even think about it. They don't want to be bothered. It talks about them in about a line and a half. They won't consider it. No use wasting time on it. Then it talks for about 12 lines, verse 8 through 20 of the second surah, 13 lines about all those people in between, which was me. I may have been an atheist, but I was willing to listen. I may have been an atheist, but I was curious. I wasn't an outright rejecter, just couldn't satisfy my doubts. But here I was, in the middle, and that was me, and I knew it. As you read through that second surah, it summarizes 
Islam's major themes. And then from there on out, you're sort of hooked. Right? What's your first question? Well, your first question is, what's the purpose of life? Why did God create us? Did he put us here just to punish us? You start reading the second surah, and it begins to answer that question. The angels ask, why create this being? Who creates suffering and sheds blood? When we celebrate your praises and glorify your holy name. You know what reaction was when I read that? Wait a minute, that's my question. Why put us here on earth to suffer? Why make this creature who could commit terrible wrongs and put him in this environment where he could exercise his most negative and destructive tendencies? Why didn't you make us angels and just put us up into heaven if it was within your power? That was my question. I had asked it of priests, I had asked it of rabbis, I had asked it, asked it of Buddhist monks, I had asked it of Hindus, I had asked it of Hare Krishnas on campus, I had asked it of everybody. Everybody said, I don't know. <laughs> Just got to have faith. Here I was, not but several lines into the Quran, verse 30 of the second surah, and my question is put there in the mouth of the angels. Slowly but surely, the Quran begins to unravel an answer. And as it does, it takes you through so many different facets and angles of life. It interjects different parts of its message as it lures you into its design. So as I read the Quran and proceeded along, I was trapped. It was written. I felt it was written perfectly for a non-believer. And so I would very much encourage you, if you have somebody, and he is honestly interested in Islam, but feels he doesn't have the time, point him in the direction of the Quran. A good interpretation, one that you found that you trust in English, and get him in that direction. Nothing is more powerful in showing people the way to Islam than the Quran. Uh, next question is pretty brief. It says, the speech you just gave was taken from your latest book. If so, when will it be published? Uh, I don't know. You have to talk to Amana Publishers. No, I'm... <laughs> um, I am right now on page 170 on my computer. Uh, I'm just finishing the fourth chapter. It's called The Pillars of Islam. I have two more chapters to write. They're sort of brief. One is about the trials and tribulations a typical Muslim convert faces when they enter the Muslim community. The things I think that we Muslims do to dissuade people from staying in the community, and the positive things we do that I think help people to find comfort and peace within that community. So I discuss the Muslim community. And then in the fifth, uh, fifth the last chapter, very briefly, I discuss what I, my hopes and dreams for my children as uh, Muslims in America, and my hopes for the future of Muslims in America, and the problems I think they'll have to face. So I think I have about 40 pages left. So it should be about 210 pages long. Sorry, I have to talk about it in these terms, but I'm envisioning it as my head in the typewriter as I'm talking to you. Yeah, mathematician. 40 pages usually takes me about 40 days to write. So I think in about two months I'll be done, and I'll send it off to the publishers, and they'll start editing it, and we'll start communicating back and forth, maybe about a year and a half from now. Well, I, you know, it takes time. <laughs> Then they gotta print it, they gotta manufacture it, they gotta publish it. Once they get once I send it to them, it's out of my hands though. I have nothing to do with it except for checking. You know? Okay. Sorry. Okay, Jazakallah khair. Um the next question uh, is regarding prayer. If you guys could keep the the question topics according about prayer, that would be very helpful because we have so many questions. Um, the question says, How do you put all your concentration into your prayers? Well, you do the best you can. Uh, you know, when I'm praying, and I think you probably found this useful as well, when you pray, it's very difficult, I mean, to have total concentration during your prayer. But I think it's good that while you're performing your prayer, to interrupt yourself at times and think about, genuinely think about, something that you're grateful to Allah for. Think about a deep concern you have for someone close to you, and you communicate that to Allah during your prayer. Think about something that 
you feel you may not have done quite right, a doubt you have about yourself. And ask God to forgive you for that and to help you with that. Most importantly, try to adopt an attitude of humility during your prayer. I think this is just my personal advice. The more I find the more humble, sincerely humble, you are in your prayer. The more when you turn to prayer, you acknowledge and admit to Allah your dependence upon Him. The more you turn your heart totally over to Him and concentrate on that, the more you try to envision His greatness compared to your smallness. His kindness compared to your humanity. The more you concentrate on his beautiful attributes, most powerful names, I find the more beautiful is the experience of your prayer. So as you recite the Quran, interrupt yourself at stages. Just don't recite your prayer as a formula. Stop yourself at moments. And whenever you feel so during your prayer, stop yourself at a verse and communicate to Allah your deepest feelings about him. And be thankful for what he has given you. And ask for his help, sincerely, from the depths of your heart. And tell him, although he already knows how much you need him and you want to grow near to him. Because when you do that, you are opening your heart to his light. And on, like I said, those most beautiful moments almost never come as in, when anticipated. Sometimes they come and you're not even trying. When you're not, you're just standing there in your prayer and you're reciting al fatha and all of a sudden you'll feel this beauty take, take over you. But still, I think it's the attitude with which you approach that prayer. If you approach it just as a burden that you want to get out of the way, then it's a, probably going to be a burden that you just get out of the way. And you will receive a reward for it because it will develop your steadfastness, persistence, etc. But if you approach it as a humble servant of God Almighty, as one who depends on Him totally, that has total trust in Him, I think it will enhance the beauty of your prayer all the more, and God knows best. But I will say this, to all of us, we need to remember this, and we have to remind ourselves of this. Don't miss the prayers. Don't skip the prayers. Skip the prayers, you're taking a step backwards. And then you have a difficult time getting back to where you were before. Pray day in, day out, as prescribed, and you will slowly but surely notice a progress in your spirituality. You will notice that the beauty of the prayers increases with that performance of prayer. You will notice that if you compare your experience of prayer to the way it was three years ago, there is something greater about it now than it was then. Provided that you're also trying to live the life of a Muslim, sincerely trying to be humble and compassionate to others, to be truthful, to be, to be fair to your neighbor, to be just, to be honest, etc., etc. But most of all, with all that, don't miss a prayer. Because you take a huge step backwards. And you've got to start again. I'm not saying you go back to step one. I, frankly, I don't know. But you do go back, and you've got to bring yourself forward again. At least as I am, as I perceive it. There's one question that asked about which uh, translation of the Quran do you think was more beneficial for non-Muslims? Well, it depends on the non-Muslim. Um, you know, the one that moved me the most, strangely enough, was one that and I'm not recommending it, I'm just saying for me personally, was one that came with no commentary and was done by a non-Muslim. His name was Arthur Arbery, an English prof a professor, an English professor, but he wasn't a professor of English. He was an Englishman, a professor, scholar of Arabic, who worked at, in, uh, I forget the university, Oxford, or I'm not quite sure, in, in England. And he did this translation, and that was the first one I stumbled on, this in his interpretation. And it moved me great. After that, I stumbled on, what's his name? Uh, Dawood? Um, no, not Yusuf Ali. 
Marmaduke Pickfall. And I found his very enlightening. Also, I like the fact that he didn't provide so much commentary. For somehow that was a distraction for me in the beginning. After that, I read uh, Yusuf Ali's. I found it enjoyable. Uh, I found that I got things out of it I didn't get out of others. I didn't agree with him on all the points. He's exercising his opinion very frequently. But still, I found it valuable. But you have to realize that these are men, and they are providing their opinions on so many things. They don't pretend to be perfect. After that, I read uh, Muhammad Assad. He had some interesting ideas in it. Uh, I found some of the things he said very enlightening. I took some, I discarded others. After that, I read uh, Muhammad Ali's. It seemed that he was one of the earliest interpreters of the Quran into English. He did a, fair good, a fairly good job. I had a lot of respect for that interpretation. Uh, let's see, who else did I read? I read, um, uh, who? Yeah, Hamid Assad. I read, uh, oh, lots of people. I just read about everyone I could find. Uh, recently, I've read the one that the Saudis, uh, Saudi Arabian um, Organization for the Propagation of Islam put out. I like that very much. That one, I think, is very nice. Almost any of those are, are suitable. Uh, pardon? T.B. Irving. T.B. Irving had a very nice, did a very nice job. I like that. He did it for people who don't like Shakespearean English. For some reason, most Muslim interpreters inevitably use Shakespearean English. I don't know why. You know? Uh, a lot of people have difficulty with it. I happen to like Shakespeare, so I enjoyed it. But uh, T.B. Irving, a lot of people prefer his work. I would suggest that you use the interpretation of a sincere Muslim. Because that sincerity will show forth, the intensity of his faith will also come out in his work, and that, I think, will be very inspiring and helpful as well. Any other questions? Okay, Zakalaka. A large portion of these questions are about uh, the atheists and how, what did you, what would you tell an atheist that would spark interest in Islam, or how would you discuss Islam with them or prove the existence of God? So, I, uh, I don't really try to prove the existence of God to an atheist. An atheist doesn't really come at you and says, "Prove God exists to me." Most people don't expect that much. They, most atheists believed in God at one point in their life, and because of various rational or emotional things, rejected that belief at one stage. So they have the seed of belief in them at one stage in their life, but because of a bitter experience within the, the religion of their birth, they reject religion altogether. So usually I wouldn't suggest for you to come to an atheist and say, I'm going to prove the existence of God. If there were an empirical proof of God, a proof that we could use simply with the five senses, that would be convincing to everyone, no matter what, then we, everybody on earth would automatically believe. But that's, there, I, I, there is no such simply and purely empirical proof. And I've studied them all. I've even studied the ones by Ibn Sina and others. And you have to make certain very strong assumptions for them to work, those arguments. And an atheist might not accept those assumptions. What I am saying is this, that with an atheist, you're taking the wrong approach if you say, I am going to prove to you that God exists. Because you get in a circle, circle, circle. Let him start. His starting position is this, that I have reasons why I do not believe in God. And then he'll start to explain them to you. I don't believe in God because I can't explain the suffering, and this is why we're here to suffer. I don't believe in God because... If there's a God, can he make a rock that's too heavy for himself to lift? You know, let's say goofy things sometimes. Uh, if God is omnipotent, can he kill himself? You know, and things like that. You know, or uh, I don't believe in God because he could have made us angels to start with. And he made us men, inferior. I don't believe in God because this world is imperfect. And a perfect God, if he creates an imperfect world, means he's somewhat imperfect. So he'll start giving you various arguments that he's invented over the years for why there is not a God. And then, if you study the Quran carefully and study your faith carefully, I think you'll be, begin to point him in the right direction. I'm not saying you'll be able to answer all those questions for him, but you should think about what the Quran says about those issues and say, oh, you know, the Quran says this, and the Quran does talk about that. 
I personally don't quite understand it, but I know that there are atheists who converted to Islam who found their answers in the Quran. I know this one in particular, this blonde guy, professor from the University of Kansas. He became a Muslim through the Quran. And he was an atheist. You know, just, and then let him go from there. You know, and he might say, huh, what did he say? What did he do? Do you have a tape? Do you have a light? Not, I wouldn't suggest that I'm the one to do the trick, but I'm just saying. He might say, you know, he might get something out of seeing what another atheist went through. But most importantly, get him in the right direction. Yeah. But don't come into him, walk up to him like you have a suit of armor on and say, I am going to prove to you that there is a God. No. No. Say, I believe in God very much, and because of my religion, I do this and I do that. He'll say, he or she will say, ah, well, I respect your faith, but I personally don't believe in God. And these are the reasons why. And then you could get into a good, good discussion. Shoot, uh, please. <laughs> uh, she is a Muslim. I met her through uh, Muslim families in San Francisco. And I went about it in sort of the semi-traditional way. <laughs> you know, they had me over for dinner. They had me over for outings and picnics and stuff like that. They realized I was an Amriki and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> most, most of the families that introduced me to their daughters or aunts or relatives, they were a little bit flexible with me. I mean, they allowed me some... Maybe I noticed that among Arabs, they're very strict with each other. You know, decide right now. <laughs> it's all right, you had 30 seconds, <laughs> you know. With me, they allowed me many, many visits, and lots of discussion, and telephone conversations, and dinners, lots of dinners. Food was very good. <laughs> I gained about 15 pounds looking for a wife. <laughs> okay, does that go? Now we have three beautiful children. Okay. And you missed them very much, right? Yes, and I missed them very much. <laughs> okay, um, the next, there's a whole bunch of questions that deal with uh, what exactly led you to becoming a Muslim, and have you ever had any second thoughts about any other religions? Second thought, after I became a Muslim, or? After you became a Muslim. After I became a Muslim, I never had any, uh, I mean, you have to remember, I had so much anger inside me. And so, what I felt were such strong objections to Islam, to religion in general, and I had searched really every other religion, major world religion, before come even considering Islam, because Islam has such a negative reputation in the West that I thought, well, this one, <laughs> this, this religion of the terrorists, I definitely don't want to consider. You know, any religion that fosters terrorism. Uh, I don't know why I was felt so easily into that prejudice. I know that Western authors could be very prejudiced, but somehow I believed it when they spoke about Islam. Because they were also unanimously prejudiced against, hated it. But in any case, so that was the last one I considered. So I considered others, and then I came up empty. My feelings against religion were so strong. By the time I became a Muslim, I was so, or began looking into Islam, researching it, I had lost all hope in ever believing in God, really. So you can imagine that after I became a Muslim, there was no real reason to have second thoughts about whether another religion could do the job. First of all, I knew they couldn't because I had already tackled those. And the second thing is, is that once you felt the power of this religion, it's that power that becomes your confirmation. I mean, suddenly, it was the, rational, it's the Quran's rational approach to faith that made, helped me to become a Muslim. It was the answers it provided to my questions that helped me to become a Muslim. But once you've tasted faith, once you've felt Islam, that becomes your justification. So I can't even remember all the rational arguments I had anymore. Because once I felt the power of this religion, they seemed insignificant. I'm not saying they weren't important. They were important. They stood as roadblocks. The Quran smashed those roadblocks. But once it did, and once I felt the beauty and power of this religion, 
There was no turning back. Why would he want to? Wouldn't make sense. You know, it's as if I was blind and I was looking for something and people were saying, no, go here and go here and go here. You'll get, if you go here, you'll get your sight. Another one says, you go here, you get your sight. If you go here, you get your sight. See this doctor, he could get you your sight. Go to this clinic, it'll get you your sight. And you're looking around and you try one and it doesn't work. You try another, it doesn't work. You look into this, it doesn't work. You don't look into that. And finally you come to this institution and you get your sight. Well, after that, you don't need any more proof you're going to get your sight. You've gotten it. I hope I'm making sense. <laughs> and like my daughter, you're saying, I think so. <laughs> okay. Okay, um, the next question is, the next question says, why did Allah make this world if he already knew what would happen? Yeah, that's always an interesting question. That's like uh, predestination, right? And uh, you, this is a very ancient question. This is a typically Christian question, also a typically Zoroastrian question. Uh, the idea of predestination. If God determines everything in advance, if in the past he determined everything that's going to happen in the future, then what's the purpose of all of this? But I think if we approach this, we have to stick very close to the Quran, that type of question. I'm just going to touch upon it briefly. One thing for sure that God maintains is that God transcends this very space-time environment he has created for us to live in. He is not bound by the limitations of space that this space-time environment, this creation contains, and he is not bound by the limitations of time. The spatial, the fact that he is infinite in relation to space, we could readily appreciate. None of us in this audience would say, that God could possibly be on a bus between Chicago and Toledo at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. The reason being because we understand that God transcends space. He's not bound by his limitations. We do not think of God as finite in space. In the same way, we do not think of God as finite in time, like we are. We are bound by the limitations of time. He transcends time. He is outside of time and outside of this space, the space-time environment we live in. He is not limited by it in any way. The reason why I say this is because the question you just posed situates God in time as we are. If you say that, how could, if God in the past knew what was happening in the future, we assume that somehow God was, is bound in time as we are, and at some point in the past he was looking forward to the future, it situates God in time as we are. But that's erroneous assumption. That's, I believe, a weak and false assumption, that God is finite in time, that he is sometime in the past looking forward to the future. He transcends time. That's the wrong question. We should say, if God's knowledge encompasses all time and space, this entire space-time creation that we exist in, if it is all that knowledge is like a single speck for him, like a moment, a single atom, of wisdom, of everything that happens in space and everything that happens in time is encompassed by God's knowledge, then why did he make this happen? Suddenly the question loses its force. He made it happen, even though God controls all, that all space and time is one for him, that he is not bound by its limitations, that doesn't mean that God does not allow us to make choices that as far as we're concerned, we progress in space and time, doesn't negate that at all. So the point I'm trying to make is, is that the question that you ask assumes a false, makes a false assumption to begin with, that God is limited in time. The notion of Qadr, God's infinite power, that God's power encompasses all in space and time, should not be framed as the ancient philo Greek philosophers framed it that God is somehow finite in time looking forward to the future as we humans are. The notion of Qadr is that God's power and his knowledge encompasses all. Oops, I got loud. Everything. And as far as we are concerned, we make choices, etc., and he responds to them. But we just should not assume that God is finite in time. We can readily appreciate that God transcends times because a little bit we have the notion that if we get up really high, 
Transcend means sort of get up high. That's what the root comes from. If we get up high enough, we could see many things happening below in different spaces at once. And so we can somehow appreciate what it means to transcend time, our knowledge of uh, space. Our knowledge could encompass what's happening at different points in space simultaneously. But God's being also transcends time. This is philosophy. I hope I'm not boring you all to death. But God's knowledge transcends time. So for him, all things that happen, even though they appear at different points in time, are as one. And he is not limited by that in any way, shape, or form. So a Muslim would have no difficulty answering the question. He would just tell the person who asked it that you're asking it in a way that naturally leads to a contradiction because your question contains a false assumption to begin with. And any time you begin an argument with a false assumption, you're going to be led to a contradiction. Here's a simple example that's analogous to the question that was just asked me. And I don't blame the person for asking it. It was a beautiful question and an important question. And I know you're all probably thinking, what is he saying? <laughs> but here's another example of how if you begin a question with, two, with a false assumption, with a contradiction, it'll naturally lead to contradictions. Assume a circle is a square. Then I ask you, does a circle have corners? Well, let me see. If I concentrate on the properties of a square, then the answer is yes. But if I proper, concentrate on the roundness of a circle, then the answer is no. Oh my god, I'm led to a contradiction. And then a typical foolish person will then say, oh, well, I don't know what's going on, and get frazzled. What that person should do is go back to the question. Does the assumption make sense? Assume a circle is a square. And similarly, if you begin a question and say, if God in the past predestined the future, go back to the original question. Is God stuck in the past? Is God finite in time? Is he limited by time as we humans are? Does he sit in relation to time as we do? No. And the Quran makes this perfectly clear. A day for God is like 50,000 years of your time. A day for God is like a thousand years of your time. Showing that time for God is nothing like time for us. The day of judgment. What was this life on earth? I'll say to you, oh boy, I lived 65 years. You'll say, I live 70 years. How will it appear on the day of judgment when, we, when the reality suddenly comes to us? Our notion of time will suddenly seem confused, like it wasn't objectively real. You'll say, uh, let's see, uh, was it an hour? Was it less than that? Was it a day? Was it 10 days? It seemed like a, suddenly our, we're confused because time as we perceived it is no longer an objective reality. Finally, when the Quran talks about the day of judgment, it talks about it in the past tense, future tense, I think even the present tense, which shows that this happens in a whole other order of creation that is not limited by our space-time concepts. The long and the short of what I'm trying to say is, be careful when you answer questions. Think about the premises on which those questions are asked. If you seem to be running yourself in circles and contradictions, go back to the premises and analyze them. There may be a contradiction subtly placed there. Sorry about the long discussion. But I have these with my daughter all the time. <laughs> I really do. And we get into them for hours. Daddy, what does subtly mean? What is it? Sorry about that. Okay, we had we had a lot of questions that dealt with the cut with uh, hijab and it asks um when you were before you became Muslim, what did you what did you think or what did you feel when you saw Muslim women with hijab and what do you think about it now? Uh I can't wear one. <laughs> <laughs> I tried, <laughs> Got people taunted me, I gave it up. Now, uh, when I saw the Muslims before I, let's see, before I became a Muslim, I didn't know who those people were. <laughs> I frankly thought they were either nuns or Seventh-day Adventists, or I didn't really know. Nowadays, I think people know better, because back when I became a Muslim, you just didn't see ladies wearing that in America. Nowadays, I think it's clearer to people um, now what do I think when I see them? But to be frank, I'm kind of happy. You know, I, I know it's very difficult for a lot of the sisters. And I realize that uh, a lot of them face tremendous hardship, which we men seem to be completely insensitive about. But most of them fa face terrible difficulties, tremendous hardship, put up with terrible sacrifices. 
that many of us males would fail to do, wouldn't be strong enough to do. So I have a tremendous amount of respect for the sisters that do. For those that don't or can't or are struggling with it, I understand it's very difficult, and I certainly realize the, the hardship and the difficulties they're facing, and I uh, could definitely appreciate it, especially here in America. Um, that I understand. Uh, but still, what I see personally, when I see a Muslim sister walking down the street, I feel, and I can identify her as such. It's a very pleasant feeling, and because they are upholding an alternative to the to the style, to the morals, to the mores, to the uh, direction that the Western culture is pointing women. And I think that takes a tremendous amount of courage, especially when they're such a tiny minority of this society. So I have a tremendous amount of respect for them. But the only thing is, I wish when I would pass them on the street and I say, Salaamu Alaikum, they would respond to me and say, Alaikum Salaam. <laughs> I don't know if it's because I look very American or what, but they always look at me like, <laughs> and or maybe they just don't like saying hello to fellow Muslims. I don't know. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, used to say "Salamu alaikum" when he saw the ladies passing on the street, and they would respond "Wa alaikum salam." But nowadays, I think some of the sisters get offended when I say that, and I uh, don't understand why. Maybe it's uh, something that the uh, I don't a cultural thing. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> but oh, it's the brothers. Uh, they. they you're uh, uptight about it, huh? Probably. <laughs> yeah, I find that most of the problems in our community begin with the men, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, here's an interesting question. It says, that I know people who are kind and good and they're not hurting anyone and they're wondering if having, they're not fulfilling their Islamic objections, uh, obligations, and they're wondering if it's if is it merely enough to have good character. Well, let me ask answer that question in extreme form. The question is, if somebody is kind, good, and humanitarian, merciful towards his fellow human beings, helps his friends, his neighbors, is uh, compassionate to others, is he, from the Islamic point of view, what uh, going to achieve success in this life and the hereafter? Something to that effect. And let me take the extreme. Let's let's say the person is an atheist. Well, God knows best. And God, it depends on what that person knows. It depends on so many things that are beyond my knowledge. How God will, how that person will stand on the day of judgment. Maybe he was, no one ever explained to him the truth. Maybe he uh, was incapable of perceiving the truth. Maybe his circumstances, I really don't know. I do know this, that God never holds a person to account for something until that person has had a true warning, true warner. Uh, but I will say this, that the Quran does not so much deal with these sort of gray cases. It deals with real practical cases because when the Quran approaches the reader, if he's gotten into that stage where he's approaching the Quran, he's ready for the message of that revelation. And once that revelation starts calling to him, it presents things in very stark terms. And the message seems to be essentially this. If you're a good person and you refuse to have a relationship with God, you refuse to even acknowledge God, you refuse to have anything to do with the idea of God, I think generally that person is in a lot of trouble. And the reason why I say this I'll give you an analogy. Because that person is not cultivating the most important relationship in his life. We are here to come to know and grow nearer to God. That person might be a fine human being. He might be a great humanitarian. He might be making himself feel very good inside by everything he does. He might be getting a lot of peace and well-being for it. But the only real relationship that matters, really, in that person's life is not being developed at all. God's love is there for him to turn to. But if he doesn't turn to it, he's never going to receive it. Because love is a two-way street. God's love and mercy is there to shower on all. But you have to enter into that loving relationship with God. You have to turn to him in love. 
Let me give you the following example. Let's say I have three daughters, hypothetically. And let's say one of them, for some reason or another, chooses not to acknowledge that I exist. To such an extent that she never even knows that I exist. Never even cares whether I exist. Never does anything to even observe the fact that I exist. And so no matter how much love I shower in that daughter's direction, no matter how much mercy I pour on that daughter, no matter how many gifts I bestow on that child, and no matter how good he is or she is to all the other people on this earth, that daughter will never experience my parental love. That daughter will never know my parental mercy and caring. Will never develop a relationship to receive that and experience that. So it'll go throughout life having totally missed that. I see the situation of an atheist who does good deeds towards others and is a great humanitarian in a similar light. Now, I am not God to judge that person's ultimate fate. But frankly, if it was my friend and to raise this question with me, I would say that you have something very serious to consider. And I don't have much hope for such a person. You know, life is full of choices. Nobody simply is born to disbelieve in God. Disbelieve in God is a choice, and it is made at a point in a person's life. And we're responsible for the choices we make. And believe me, as an atheist, I'll tell you this. I'm not an atheist anymore, but I was for many years. You were presented many opportunities to think about God. I'll give you one last example. I had a friend, an atheist, a very good friend. Still a very good friend, colleague as a matter of fact. Came down with cancer, pancreas cancer. They said the cancer was as big as a football almost. The doctors gave her no hope. Went to the hospital. Called from the hospital. Said, I don't know what to do. Would you pray for me? I said, I can't pray for you. I said, of course I could pray for you. But I said, what's the point of me praying for you if you don't pray for you? Nobody could do anything for you unless you want to have it done yourself. Like an alcoholic that has to give up drinking, I can't do it for you. You've got to turn yourself. In any case, I don't know what happened, but she said that if I ever get cured from this disease, I will definitely strongly consider that religion that you adhere to. Lo and behold, it performed the operation. And she's alive today. Now I'm not saying it was because of that statement of hers. God's mercy encompasses all things and he does what he wills according to his design. I'm not trying to presume that I know why things turned out the way they did. But I do know this. That today, when I talk about my religion, she mocks it. When I talk about my religion, she says, oh, I don't believe in that. The point is, is that she has already gone back on her promise to God. She was given the opportunity and the choice, and now she rejects it. And believe me, aside from her obstinate and rebellious rejection of God, she's a nice person to people. She helps neighbors, gives gifts to friends, etc. And she's a miserable. And she's miserable because there's something empty and missing in her life. But she was given that choice. And I know, as an atheist, you've given many. God makes them come to you. And so I don't see where, I don't, having lived that life, I don't see where many people have, many, have an excuse. You know, we have a brain to think with. God gave us hearing, sight, and senses to perceive with. He gave us minds to utilize. And he gives us opportunities to learn. And we either reject them or take them. We're a creature of choice. Any other? I got over. I got too long into that. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, the next question says, uh, "What do you say to an atheist when he/she asks who created God?" I say, no one. <laughs> no, I. You know, it's, it's obvious. You know, I mean, I, t I just tell them that one of the attributes of God is He is the Creator. If you don't want to accept that, I mean, that's up, up to you. If you don't want to believe that there is a creator. 
You know, but we believe that God is the creator. There's some things that are silly to argue about. You know, who created God? One of the attributes of God is the creator. Obviously, from our point, religious point of view, he's not created. You know, and that's it. There's nothing, yeah, there's nothing to, there's nothing to argue. You know, there's sometimes you just have points of difference. I know how the argument usually goes. You say God is the creator of all things. That's why I say it's silly to say that, try to prove to somebody there's a God by saying, well, who created all this? Because then he'll say, well, who created God? That argument simply will not work with an atheist. They've already rejected the idea of a creator. And so you're getting yourself into pointless arguments. You need to know the mindset of the person you're arguing with. But remember this. At some stage in every atheist's life, that person consciously rejects belief in God. And so when you present your belief in God, they're going to give you rational objections to that belief. Attack the rational objections. Don't try to come at them with a proof. Okay? I'm tired. You guys wore me out. Keep the question simple tomorrow, all right? Okay, Jazakallah Khair, Brother Jeffrey Lang. Inshallah, we're going to... We're going to take all the questions and give them to Brother Jeffrey Lang. Maybe he'll cover them. Can everybody please remain seated? We have a lot of important announcements to make. Inshallah, he'll cover them in his speech tomorrow. Or he can, you know, maybe incorporate them in the last two chapters of his book. <laughs> and first of all, the first announcement to make, I want to reiterate what Brother Amen Hedia had explained earlier today. We have a new curfew system because we've had a few problems. So, inshallah, we'd like, to, we'd like to enforce that today. But let me explain the rules one more time. From 11.30 till Fajr, nobody under the age of 18 is allowed to be up, sitting around in the lobby, or roaming around. Everybody has to be an adult who wants to be up, or they have to, you know, they have, to have a really, really good reason. And if any of the staff, the hotel staff, or any of the Maya staff asks you, you must give them your name right away and you'll, you'll be given a warning instantly, and then the second time you'll be asked to leave the conference. And if any, if nobody, if you, get, if you don't cooperate, then a lot more extreme measures will be taken. Also, um, I'd like to ask the brothers in the back, uh, the brothers who are uh, coordinating, inshallah, we're gonna dismiss the sisters all first, when I say not right now, and the vans will all be the sisters only until all the sisters are gone, and then, inshallah, we'll let the brothers leave. So you guys have quite a while to wait. Just please uh, sit tight. Okay, and one last announcement before we get going. Um, everybody, please listen up. There's been complaints that there's a lot of children that are in the hall that are crying and making a lot of noise. So please take them to the, the Radisson Hotel where they have services provided for just about any age kid that you have. And they'll take care of them for you, inshallah. Yeah, yeah I, have, I have important announcement too. Uh, well, concerning the curfew, I'd like just to put it in, a, in, in another way. I see it differently. Uh, no kids are allowed without their parents after 11.30, so it, it's as simple as that. I hate the word curfew, uh, making it big and making us... Uh, you know, I go to other conferences with non-Muslims sometimes and professional conferences, and uh, I've seen kids doing much worse than uh, our kids do, so don't feel so bad about it, though it's, it's not good. But at least, you know, it's, it's something, inshallah, we can handle. No kids are allowed after 11.30 without their, their parents. Uh, the important announcement that I have is that tomorrow's program will be modified than the form that you see in, in your notes here about the program. This will change tomorrow. Because there were some programs that were designed to be uh, transmitted over satellite. And unfortunately, this is canceled. There is no satellite programs that will be done tomorrow. Accordingly, inshallah, we'll have a change. There will be a lecture by a speaker from England, who comes from England. And uh, this will be in the morning. I'm trying to coordinate with the... Uh, Arabic program, the activities with them. So most probably that will be the first one in the morning. Dr. Jeffrey's Lang lecture will be given in the Arabic program and it will be short, short one. It will be in the main convention center. 
And most probably it will be at different times. So I'm not sure if you're going to be able to attend that one or not. And then the one after that will change too. We'll give you in writing. The first thing in the morning, you will have the program, the detailed program for the day in writing, inshallah, tomorrow morning. The tapes for this lecture will be available, inshallah, first thing in the morning or late tonight, inshallah. The other lectures are available at Maya Disc uh, if you need them. Also, Dr. Jeffrey's book, the first book, Struggling to Surrender, is available in the bazaar. And I'll have some copies here, inshallah, tomorrow morning, if you would like to get a copy of his first book, Struggling to Surrender. Thank you. Yes. No. Thank you very much. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Wal'asr. Inna al-insana lafi khusr. Illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu al-salihati wa tawasaw bil-haqi wa tawasaw bil-sabr. Assalamu alaikum. Brothers, could you please remain seated or stay in your spot and stretch if you want to get up and stretch. Inshallah, wait for all the sisters to leave and be at the other hotel. And then, inshallah, you guys can all go. Assalamu alaikum. 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 Assalamu alaikum.